Today's show is brought to you by Babbel. Whether you want to learn for travel, to talk to friends and family, or because you just love learning, Babbel will get you speaking confidently in your new language. I'm learning Spanish, but you could learn French, Italian, German, or more. Babbel has 14 different languages you could choose. And Babbel's convenient 10 to 15 minute lessons are available on your computer, smartphone, or tablet. Listeners get three months of Babbel free when you sign up for three months. Visit B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash grammar and use the offer code grammar. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and this week we'll talk about accents, espresso, and idioms that use the number six. First, G.T. Youngblood wrote a review on iTunes and in it asked a question that piqued my curiosity. He said that whenever he's around people with accents, he unconsciously starts talking with the same accent. He picks up accents really fast and wants to know if it's some kind of condition or malady. Well, from what I could find, G.T., it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's called phonetic accommodation, and you do it when you're talking to people you like, or to people you want to like you. It's considered a social skill, possibly related to empathy, and it seems not that different from the way you talk to your buddies one way and to your boss another way. You're trying to minimize the social differences between you and your new friends. There's a similar phenomenon called unintentional mirroring, in which people mimic more than just an accent. They mimic gestures, body positions, voice modulation, and so on, for the same reasons, essentially to fit in and be likable. So don't worry about it. There's nothing wrong with you, and it probably makes it easier for you to make friends in new situations. Next, in honor of National Coffee Day, September 29th, we'll talk about espresso. I'm always happy to have an excuse to talk about espresso. And the big language thing to note is that it's pronounced espresso, not expresso. I think people might link the word express with espresso because espresso can be a fast way to get caffeine, which can make you feel faster. But espresso isn't related to the word express. It's related to the word pressed. It's short for the Italian caffè espresso which the Oxford English Dictionary says literally translates to pressed coffee. It's about how the coffee is made. But I also have to tell you that the OED also lists espresso as another form of the word. And in a search of words published in Google Books, espresso seems like it's more acceptable in British English than in American English, although it's definitely the minority in both regions. According to Ben Yagoda, writing in Slate a few years ago, words beginning with EXP are eight times more common in English than words beginning with ESP, like espresso. So that may also contribute to people saying espresso instead of espresso. It just sounds more like other words you hear. And it would also explain why this is a pattern that goes beyond just the word espresso. Because people also mispronounce especially as especially, escape as escape, and etc. as etc. It's a thing. But it's a thing that I know irritates a lot of people, so it's best to stick to the espresso pronunciation, unless your goal is to annoy people. I wonder if there's ever been a character in TV or film who mispronounces all his or her ES words like this, kind of like how Rob Lowe's character Chris in Parks and Recreation used the word literally all the time and pronounced it strangely, too. If you know of one, let me know. And speaking of pronunciation, I've never claimed to be perfect. Macronancer left a comment on one of my YouTube videos pointing out that I pronounce united as united, which I do, and I had no idea I was doing it. You may have even just heard how much I had to struggle to say it the right way. United. United. I've been saying united my whole life. So if it's not clear, I'm not trying to make you feel bad if you say espresso. I'm just trying to help. And we all learn new things here together every week. Before we get to the meaty middle about idioms that use the number six, thanks to our sponsor, Blinkist. 
The world's most successful people all have one thing in common. They're hungry for knowledge, reading and learning every chance they get. And since you're listening to this podcast, you probably feel the same way. Introducing the Blinkist app. More than 2,000 best-selling nonfiction books transformed into powerful packs you can read or listen to in just 15 minutes. Learn essential ideas from the best books in your field or subjects you never knew you loved, like productivity, business, and science. With Blinkist, you can feast your mind on key ideas from best-selling nonfiction books like The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, The 4-Hour Workweek, and Thinking Fast and Slow, all on your way home. More knowledge in less time. And their team is constantly adding new titles from best of lists, so you're always getting the most powerful ideas in a convenient, made for mobile format. No wonder Blinkist was chosen in Apple and Google's best of selection for two years. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for you, my listeners. Go to blinkist.com slash grammar and get a free trial or three months off your yearly plan when you start today. That's B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash grammar to start your free trial or get three months off your yearly plan. Blinkist.com slash grammar. Although the number seven might be considered lucky, today's episode is all about the number six. Here are six common phrases that include the word six. If it's all the same to you, let's start with six of one, half dozen of the other. As you might have guessed, you use this phrase when the two alternatives you have are the same, and so the choices are about equal. You might also hear the phrase reversed, half a dozen of one, six of the other. These two alternatives are the same because half a dozen is the same as six. This phrase was first used in 1836 by Frederick Marriott in a piece of nautical fiction called The Pirate and the Three Cutters. The second phrase that uses the number six is at sixes and sevens, which means in confusion, in disagreement, or in disorder. A parent of a messy child will probably at some point say something like, Sam's bedroom is at sixes and sevens, especially if that parent speaks British English, in which the phrase is more common. It appears that Chaucer first used the original version of this phrase, set on six and seven, in the Canterbury Tales, around 1374. According to Dictionary.com, back then, those who gambled with dice tried to roll the highest numbers possible, five and six. In Middle English, spoken at the time, the French pronunciation for these numbers, sank and cease, were often used. And it's possible the phrase is a corruption of on, sank, and cease from people who didn't know French, thinking sank and seize sounded like six and seven. The phrase originally meant to risk your entire fortune, because gamblers would risk a lot of money hoping to roll these numbers. Over the centuries, the meaning of the phrase at sixes and sevens has changed. The phrase described someone who was confused enough to make a risky bet, and then it came to mean in disagreement or in disorder. Now go clean your room, please. The third phrase that uses the word six also has its origin in vice, this time alcohol. To 86, something means to discard or reject it, and bartenders in the 1930s would call a person they wouldn't serve more liquor to an 86. At lunch counters at the same time, an 86 was also a menu item that wasn't available. Lexicographers believe it probably originated as rhyming slang for the word nix, which means to refuse to agree to something or to prohibit. These days, the phrase is commonly used as a verb, as in, I had to 86 the leftover potato salad because it sat out too long at the picnic. If you write this phrase, don't forget to include the hyphen between 80 and 6. Things are now going from bad to worse. First, gambling. Then, alcohol. Now, it's time to discuss death, as we explore two phrases that have their origins in burials. First up is deep six, which, like 86, has a hyphen in the middle. To deep six is another way to say to discard, to throw overboard or get rid of. You can 86 old potato salad, or you can deep six it. Dictionary.com states that the phrase first appeared in the 1940s or 50s, and that it comes from the traditional depth of graves, six feet. The other burial-related phrase is six feet under, 
which means simply dead. You might hear someone say, you'll see what's in my will when I'm six feet under. Like Deep Six, the phrase six feet under originated in the middle of the 20th century. Burying bodies six feet underground seems to have been a burial practice that originated in England in 1665. In reaction to a breakout of plague at the time, the mayor of London tried to limit the spread of disease by, quote, requiring graves to be at least six feet deep in an attempt to limit the spread of disease, unquote. This practice was not very effective. Coincidentally, six feet is also the approximate length of a coffin. The sixth and final phrase involving the number six has many variations, including watch your six, check your six, and get your six. You might say something like, my partner's got my six. As you may have guessed, this is police or military slang. In this case, the word six is a noun that means back. If someone has your back or your six, that person is watching out for you and protecting you. The phrase has an interesting history from the Air Force. Pilots describe directions by using an imaginary clock with 12 being dead ahead and 6 being behind. So to pilots, 6 o'clock is their back. Civilians might do something similar as in, look at the guy at 3 o'clock, which encourages you to look at someone ahead and to your right. And with that, the six phrases using the number 6 are now behind us. That segment was written by Bonnie Mills, author of The Curious Case of the Misplaced Modifier, who blogs at sentencesleuth.blogspot.com. Thanks to all of you who wrote podcast reviews and told me where you listen this week. Thanks to TBC Zero, who listens while commuting to work. Your review made me literally laugh out loud. Thank you for going so far out of your way to write it. Mirazai from Iran says, quote, I always listen to podcasts on my bed and they make me fall asleep, but your podcast keeps me wide awake, unquote. I listen to podcasts while I'm falling asleep too, but there are a few I listen to during the day for that same reason. Jay Jardle 196 listens in the morning before starting work on an MA in English at the University of Central Oklahoma. Jakey Baby 4 listens in Canada. And Bim A listens in, quote, the middle of nowhere, Central Philippines, unquote. And thanks to Plug, who wrote a review but didn't leave a location. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. Grammar Girl is part of the Quick and Dirty Tips podcast network. You can find all my old articles and podcasts and check out all the other great podcasts that are part of the network at quickanddirtytips.com. That's all. Thanks for listening. 